Over the years, I've had a fascination with trying to find newer, crazier, heavier, more boundary-pushing artists, and as much as I'd like to say that that started in the underground scene in some basement somewhere, it, it really started when I was listening to Bangarang on Skull Candy headphones when I was 11. And yeah, maybe it's a little embarrassing in hindsight, but there is no denying that watching videos like this from a very young age is sure to hardwire your brain into having weird standards for music. Now listen, I know electronic dance music is a huge shift from my usual video essays, but it is surprisingly fitting considering how many EDM artists have a background in heavy music, or at the very least, a heavy interest in heavier music. I mean, think about it. Rave bros love spending $60 to stand in a field dressed like an idiot and listen to the most annoying sound you've ever heard in your life, and honestly, Grind fans are not that different. The only real difference is tax bracket, color palette, and aroma. Although the two genres are extremely different in terms of production, fan base, appearance, cultural acceptance, etc., they both have the same goal of going, hey man, uh, you wanna hear some crazy shit? And for me personally, the answer to that question is always yes. From the album art, to the logos, to the god tier stage production, to the genuinely awful, fashion choices you see sometimes, it's just surprising that you don't really hear anyone sit down and talk about it ever. Any of it ever. So I'm just gonna talk about all of it in one video. I hope you enjoy. Quick disclaimer before we get started, uh, like, I'm serious about epilepsy warning for this video. Also, just a heads up, I'm gonna be ignoring some of the exact phrasing of certain subgenres just to keep things simple. Bass music, EDM, dubstep, other subgenres, it doesn't really matter, you know what I'm talking about. And lastly, Dat6 artwork will pop up on occasion, but do not take that as a show of support. That dude sucks, he's also the creepiest looking guy I've ever seen. This video is a fun discussion on visual trends, not the producers themselves but since his influence was everywhere at one point, it is kind of impossible to make this video without having something with his name attached occasionally pop up. It's not a huge deal, but I wanted to address it anyways just to make it super clear that he sucks. But all right, enough of that. First up, we're gonna talk about album covers. There is a lot to talk about when it comes to album covers for electronic dance music, so I'm just gonna start with my personal favorite era, the Five Gum era. Do you remember watching TV back in 2010 and there was a lot of surprisingly stylistic advertisements for things like Five Gum and Verizon Droid? Around this era, a lot of advertising and packaging was trying to push the idea of style and the future, despite just being gum and heart problems. This whole style is an offshoot of Dark Fruitager Arrow. It's a subset of the Fruitager Arrow aesthetic that was very prominent throughout the 2000s, and it is from this style that 2010's dubstep really found its look. Scary robots, skulls, lightning, lasers, nondescript goop, all with a single solid neon accent color, and man, it was, it went hard. This style is my favorite. It's sleek, it's cool, it just screams the future is now old man, and yeah, it's all 480p, but it was the 2010s, what are you gonna do? Is it cheesy and a bit try hard at times, yes. But it is also an undeniably iconic look that the genre embraced right as it was being launched into more mainstream listenership. Even more palatable artists like Dead Mouse had a very straightforward dark Fudiger Arrow aesthetic. It was everywhere in dance music. And ironically enough, uh, you know how a lot of Fudiger Arrow eventually kind of devolved into a more modern flat design? Well, dubstep has kind of been going in the same direction. Take all of these albums, for example, right? The classic earlier work from all of these artists, right? Okay, now let's just fast forward later into their discography and see what happens. Oh, oh, okay, yep, it all got flattened. Now, obviously, it's not as bad as some of the other examples, but just to see dubstep artwork as a whole go from looking like this to looking a little bit more like the Roku home screen is just a little bit of... It's a little depressing. It's not bad art, obviously, but the bland lack of depth makes it far more forgettable than all the art styles that came before it. Nowadays, it's just like, here's an astronaut floating in space, or here's some white and gold unity assets. And although it's not bad, it's fine, it's okay, it's just like, like, where's the giant robot with green lightning coming out of its eyes? You know what I mean? All design everywhere seems to be heading towards this direction, however, so maybe I'm in the minority and everyone loves it and I'm just a hater, uh, but I, I don't like it, is my point. All art changes with time, however, and there is no denying that this aesthetic, although kind of cool, does also look like a pre-made 3D intro to a 12-year-old's 
like, let's play Minecraft channel, so it does sort of feel a little dated and cringe. So although I understand the change, I'm, I'm personally uh, not too happy with it. But all criticisms aside, there are still plenty of artists that I think have a defined, recognizable visual aesthetic that is worth discussing. Space Laces started off having a very, um, unique art style. The only thing more surprising than such a prominent artist having such a ridiculous art style is that this art style was maintained for the entire first half of his career. Later moving on to a very fitting, tastefully pseudo retro aesthetic that I just absolutely eat up. And on this note, by the way, if you zoom in and you see this like, like borderline shrink wrap looking texture, I think more EDM artists should do this. You don't see it too often, but when it pops up, it weirdly feels fitting. Subtronics has just such an unbelievably mwah, cohesive aesthetic. It's like Dark Footage or Arrow, but just like way more visually. It's awesome. While a lot of EDM art usually serves the sole purpose of popping up on Spotify for a second before immediately putting it back in your pocket, Subtronics art demands to be looked at, appreciated, and explored in a way that a lot of other artists just don't even bother trying to do. But you know who else pulls it off? Sudden death. I don't even need to explain why his art is so cool. You have eyes, you know that already. Trying to pull off a cohesive, recognizable, good looking aesthetic is much more easier said than done, however. But artists like Eptic and Dubloads are able to pull it off because they do all the art themselves. They both even post the process for making the visuals, which I think is really cool. Whenever an artist pulls off a cohesive visual aesthetic, what that really means is that they just commission the same people and have good ideas. But these guys built their own cohesive aesthetic with their own two hands, which gives a huge personal touch that I really appreciate. But then there's Bear Grylls, who has just such an objectively awful looking aesthetic, with a logo that looks like a traced over royalty free font almost, and album art that is just terrifying to look at. It's a nightmare all around. Although it is ugly, it is also very unique and easily recognizable to Bear Grylls and only Bear Grylls. And from an artistic and business standpoint, that's, that's pretty good. I can go ahead and make fun as much as I want. At the end of the day, it works. And surely someone with such a defined visual aesthetic like Bear Grylls isn't just going to completely throw that away to take on the same boring modern dubstep aesthetic as everyone else, right? Ah, damn it. I never thought that I would miss the original aesthetic, but it is 10 times better than this AI generated display iPhone background looking it just, it's ugly. But speaking of obnoxious colors, Ganja White Knight has album artwork that's so visually loud I feel the need to put on sunglasses in order to look at it. Got that kid's YouTube thumbnail saturation. It's, it's a bit much. Personally, I don't really like this style. It's not my cup of tea, but there's nothing wrong with it either. It's like neon cartoon monster merch for scene kids, only like if it was made for 25 year olds who sell acid, you know what I mean? It's not my thing, but I get it. There are way too many artists that I want to talk about. So for the sake of time, we're going to have a rapid fire round. Barely Alive maintains a recognizable look regardless of art style due to their signature cassette tape logo being implemented in different ways. Um, with their childish collage of stuff from Google images with all nice kind of soft pastels. It all kind of looks like a surreal meme a little bit more than it does an album cover. And I really like it. Spag Head has a consistent visual motif of spaghetti, which is both dumb and effective. Figure with horror adjacent artwork that I get a big kick out of. Must Die has the singles of an album perfectly foreshadow what the album art will eventually look like, which I always think is fun. Getter went from having a very Xbox looking aesthetic to a very flat, fun, cartoonish aesthetic to later working with Adam Medford. He's done work with bands like Viscera Infest, Fluids, and really any band that has a collage of stuff that I can't show on YouTube. I think Getter's discography is actually a good example of an artist not having a visual aesthetic that kind of works to the artist's advantage. Each release has its own visual aesthetic that works by itself instead of just appearing to be a jumbled mess of ideas that don't go together. And speaking of that, Dr. P has like no consistent visual aesthetic in a bad way. Despite being a popular name, looking at this kind of makes you wonder how much bigger he'd be if he just had a consistent visual style instead of just a mishmash of whatever. But there is one major force behind all the visual styles we've looked at so far that we haven't discussed. The good, the bad, the consistent, the inconsistent, it doesn't matter. It's all pretty much exclusively controlled by the record labels. I know that this topic might sound boring on the surface, but when it comes to electronic dance music, record labels hold so much control over the visual style that it is honestly insane and it is in my opinion the source of a lot of the problems with edm art like take circus records for instance their branding is so egregious and so impersonal it is honestly surprising that a single artist was cool with it like imagine if my videos looked like this 
that'd be unacceptable. Granted, not all of their releases look like this. There are a few outliers, but the vast majority of their discography is 99% just their logo. But if you think this artwork branding is pretty bad, let me introduce you to Rotten Recordings. Like check out this album, for example. All right, now check out this album. Now check out this EP. Now check out this single. Are you seeing a trend? Like at least Circus Records had the decency to throw a banana on it for no reason or something and a little bit of credit off to the side if you turn your neck 90 degrees, but Rotten Recordings, they're just like, nope, you get the same 200 by 200 JPEG as everyone else. Sorry, buddy. Rotten Recordings went on to really be one of the main record labels that really spearheaded the five gum aesthetic. But back in 2010, 2011, their level of branding was like almost mean spirited, but not all record labels ruin album art so callously. Sometimes they just operate under a very specific aesthetic. Disciple Records does this, Never Say Die does this, and now their aesthetic is considered legendary. Uh, same with their black label releases as well. But even if the end result of the artwork is something that I personally enjoy, I still feel like overall this is a bad thing for artists. Yeah, getting signed to a bigger label can definitely help get your foot in the door, but imagine if Sudden Death's aesthetic remained like this, you know, the same as everyone else's. Do you think he would have blown up in the way he did if he looked identical to everyone else? No, of course not. And it just makes you think how many artists never even get a chance to blow up because no one clicks on their stuff due to it being lost in a sea of nearly identical covers. No disrespect to any of the record labels that I mentioned, by the way, they all put out really great music, but since this is a discussion on visual aesthetic, I feel like it's fair criticism. All right, now before I finally move on to the next more interesting topic, there is one record label that I predict will be the future, the next era of EDM visuals, if we're lucky, it's Halcyon. Halcyon is a record label that to me personally has the sickest visual art style out there. Maybe it's just me, but I love this dude. I wanna live in these images. Even their show flyers just ooze style. It's extremely polished, it's extremely diverse. It doesn't just feel like every single art piece is made to kind of look the same like some other record labels. Each one looks very different, yet tonally it all feels connected. These art pieces really shine, especially amongst the sea of artwork that is technically not doing anything wrong, but that's somehow completely forgettable by comparison. I've followed Halcyon since day one, literally, and it's surprising that they're not more popular. Everything they put out is great. <sighs> Anyways, uh, there is a ton of other album covers that I didn't even get a chance to talk about, but for the sake of time, we're just going to move on to the next segment, my favorite segment, which is... <laughs> When it comes to stage production, EDM is miles ahead of literally every other genre, and it's not even close. It's ironic because in terms of performance, it's well, de definitely one of the more lackluster, but in terms of sheer production quality, it's not even a competition. While we're super impressed whenever a band has pyrotechnics or dead things on stage, or a drummer that does cartwheels, that's cute. Excision, on the other hand, will send you into psychosis and give you enough bass that will kill anyone over the age of 60. What's that? Exhumed has sparklers. Aw, isn't that cute? Here's 200,000 lasers. Obviously, it's not everyone's cup of tea. Everyone has personal preference. I would still rather go see a band I like play at a bar somewhere than go to what EDC or whatever. But man, you just, you gotta respect it. From like a technical and artistic standpoint, it is extremely impressive. The technicians, the lighting guys, the programmers, the drone operators, it takes a village in order to pull this stuff off and most of the people actually doing the work never even really get any of the credit. This all relies very heavily on spectacle being placed above performance, but like by a huge margin. And that's okay. But when the funness of a show relies on the level of spectacle being so high with no real performance to back it up, it can suck sometimes. A small rave may sound fun on paper, but if it doesn't have the proper funds to set the spectacle level so high with no performance to back it up, the end result is just kind of like a school dance. I'm generalizing, of course, not all small raves are gonna be bad, but like, we all know what I'm talking about. It's it's way more likely to be bad. What really sets it apart is that most stage production is very performer based. It merely acts as a backdrop, an extension of the band and their music, but it's not trying to steal the show by any means. But at big ol' EDM festivals, it's more like the Shrek 4D ride from Universal Studios. And if you think that that's an unfair comparison, Nope. The visuals for a lot of EDM shows are very silly, but they're also really fun. Like, oh look, it's a spider on a treadmill. Oh, he has a gun. That's cool. Oh, and not to mention that thing where like real lasers interact with the visuals on screen. 
I love that. Yeah, most of the time it looks like Doctor Strange meets Spy Kids 3D, but it's pretty cool a lot of the time. Here, the visuals are the main event visually, whereas if a band was playing, no one would be staring at the, their logo in the background the entire time. They'd be watching the performers, but in a situation like this, does anyone even look at the DJ, like, ever? <laughs> and if you think that that is a little bit of a harsh thing to say, do keep in mind that there are production setups where the visuals are overlaid in front of the DJ, both literally and figuratively saying, Ah, dude, who cares about the dude behind the Pioneer set? Look at the visuals! Isn't this cool? Look- Whoa! But one thing to keep in mind is that it's not all like this, by the way. The Universal Studio ride visual type stuff, that's really just the things that blow up on TikTok the most. Like, one of my favorite things, personally, is when a DJ has their own unique physical platform on stage. This allows their stage production to be nestled right in between traditional stage production and 4D movie. It's the best of both worlds. Stages like the Skrillex Mothership, the Slander Eye, the Eptic Head Thing, Cruella's Crystal Volcano, and the list just keeps going. I love this. I think it's extremely charming and it's super memorable. Yeah, it's cool to just cover everything in LEDs and have your lighting guy figure it out later, but by physically giving the stage some real depth and some tangibility with some actual props, it just makes it feel way more special. The only downside to this, however, is that it's a huge hassle to lug it from venue to venue. Plus, you gotta hire way more roadies because you have to assemble and disassemble it, and, you know, not, not to mention the whole manufacturing and designing process, and all of that is just gonna lead to it being super expensive, which doesn't really feel worth it, especially when you remember that a cheap plastic table also can do the job of holding a thing. Um, so... I get why not a lot of artists use it, because it really technically isn't worth it. I still wish more artists would do this, however, just because it's cool, but it's understandable that so many artists just don't bother. Anyways, next segment. <laughs> Visualizers are just an extension of the album art in a very over-the-top animated way and or just something that feels tonally relevant to the song playing, and that's pretty much it. They're all pretty straightforward, with the only unique exception I could think of being these two, where it's just a one-take screen recording of Ableton, which is kind of a fun twist. The music videos mostly just boil down to people looking kind of dramatic. Uh-oh, something wacky is happening. The main character sure is put into a predicament, or just a tour vlog, and that's also pretty much it. The only real deviation of these I could think of was the launchpad trend of 2012, which I think only technically counts. There was also the mini trend of real footage with animation on top that was very popular in 2016 that I was actually quite fond of. AT Aliens also just made like a straight up horror movie for their song Closer, but other than like those weird outliers, they're all pretty much the same. When it comes to both the music videos and the visualizers, they both just end up taking a back seat to everything else. But on that note, you know what else takes a back seat most of the time in electronic music? The <laughs> EDM logos can come in all different shapes and sizes, from edgy, to angular, to drippy, to pseudo handwritten, but mostly just angular, because man, there is a lot of them. If you watch this channel, then you know that I have a deep appreciation for band logos, which leads me to my biggest gripe with EDM logos in general. It's just that they like don't use them for some reason. Like, I'll give an example. A few days ago, I was scrolling on my feed and I saw this festival poster pop up. And my first thought was, oh, cool. It's just like some, some like small rave. These are local acts. Uh, I think I get, oh, oh, this is a metal festival. Oh, my bad. You're telling me these aren't local DJs? I mean, come on. But then I realized, of course, this isn't an EDM festival flyer because if it was, it would look like this or this or this. They just don't use the logos half the time for some reason. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but out of all the album covers we've looked at, like, half of them don't have their logo prominently featured, let alone featured at all. And I don't get it. I'm not talking regular text as stand-in or it's there, but it's really small. No, I'm talking prominently featured, you know, like an album cover. It is so horrendously underutilized, it's insane. Like, you know how I said that EDM visuals usually tend to flourish more when there's a consistent visual motif and or just visual themes that keep showing up? You know what else does that? A logo. Like when a band has a cool logo, they milk it for all it's worth. But when EDM has a cool logo, they use it on one show flyer. 
That's it. From an aesthetic standpoint, to a branding standpoint, to a marketability standpoint, a merchandising standpoint, and a fan service standpoint, there seems to be only positives, both artistically and financially, with having a good logo and utilizing it frequently. And they just don't do it, and it makes me feel insane. But anyways, some of my personal favorite logos would be Liquid Stranger, who utilizes both angular and trippy designs simultaneously. The Noisa logo, which if you flip it upside down, it says Vision, which I think is pretty cool. 16-bit makes music that samples both machine guns and chainsaws, and it is some genuinely hardcore stuff that would put a Victorian child in a hospital, but if you look at their logo, it's kind of cute, which I think is really funny. The Skrillex logo is just damn near perfect, and the revamped version just has so much character that I just wish it was, you know, utilized ever, but EDM doesn't do that for some reason. But one of the few places where the logos actually are utilized on occasion is... EDM fashion looks like what we thought future clothes would look like in the 80s, only like much trashier and way more expensive. Like, oh my god. I'm sure I'm not the first person to notice this, but EDM fashion has this weird trend where the women look like beautiful, breathtaking neon goddesses with very pretty or at least interesting outfits. But the men, on the other hand, look like the human equivalent of a burnt vape wearing a Rick and Morty hoodie. It's like these outfits were specifically designed to make you preemptively cover your drink. I mean, this dude literally looks like someone you'd see in a GTA 5 lobby. The contrast is just insane. Different music genres have different music styles, and those styles make sense, at least for the most part, there's a few weird ones. But electronic dance music somehow boils down to Victoria's Secret model and a spam ad you'd see on Facebook, and somehow those are the only two options? I don't, I don't get it. EDM fashion is so disjointed from the music in a way I've never seen before, and if you don't believe me, I'll prove it to you. Okay, so if you had to guess right now, what do you think is the number one piece of attire of modern dubstep fans? Go ahead, pic picture a 2024 modern dubstep fan. What is the main centerpiece of their entire outfit? Go ahead. It's baseball jerseys for some reason. No, really, if you go to rave gear websites, it is usually the very first tab that they push to you and there are so, 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 so many of them, dude. And once you notice it, you can't unnotice it. They are everywhere and it makes no sense. Do bass music and baseball fans have a, like a huge overlap that no one talks about? Or, or like what's happening? And let's not forget the headdress trend that was popular for a while there. What on earth was that about? Granted, this was way more popular in like the Coachella scene than it was like the dubstep scene, but you get my point. What was the thought process for this? Even if you were to somehow completely remove the offensive aspect of it, get rid of that, what exactly does this have to do with house music? No, really, I'm waiting. No one's explained it to me. Now, I know I'm being kind of harsh in this fashion section. It's not very plur of me, but it just really seems like rave culture really kind of struggles to get an identity sometimes. Sometimes they got it figured out, but other times, it, it really just seems like they're throwing anything at the wall and seeing what sticks. But outside of that, there are a ton of different rave attire and EDM merch staples out there, like bucket hats, ET cosplay gloves, shirts that are really long for some reason, and pashminas are extremely common, which I don't really understand because I don't really get who's getting cold in the middle of these festivals in the summer, but apparently a lot of people are because they are a very popular merch item. Sometimes merch designs will copy off of Metal Merch's homework a little bit and make something that's pretty cool. And sometimes they'll do the same thing again, only really poorly and it's really ugly and it costs twice the price for some reason and who on earth would buy this? And there are also some weird outlandish accessories like whips and supplements. Look, I'm no doctor, but don't take supplements from a rave website. But the one piece of rave attire they really popped off with is the pants. I mean, come on. Especially trip pants, although they are not my style, you gotta admit that they do go crazy. That and the overabundance of fishnets, so good. I don't know who started what, I'm not a doctor. I don't really care though, because they, they look sick and I like them. Also, outfits that utilize flash reflective material, so sick. I wish stuff like this was more predominant because it looks good on everyone and it feels more thematically relevant than like most of this. In my personal opinion, I think rave gear aesthetic works best when it's either very flowery, very goth coated, or at least heavily related to streetwear with a cyberpunk edge to it. Now that's just my personal taste. There is nothing wrong with you know, this, but if you like it, then go ahead. But it does kind of suck. Moral of the story before we move on to the last segment is ladies, keep it up and fellas, knock it off like <laughs>
is, it is unacceptable. This last section is a bit of an outlier, but it'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it. The way electronic music gets written about in big publications is so ridiculously hollow and surface level, it, it's, it's infuriating. Much like how I mentioned that band logos get written about in an extremely cringy way, electronic music suffers the same fate. Rez is going goth for the new punk slash emo EP, it's not a phase. Upon reading this, I was intrigued. Rez is a great producer and the idea of her releasing an EP in an entirely separate genre with almost no overlap is intriguing if that's what happened, because this article is just lying. What this headline is really saying is Rez releases EP with a little bit of regular tuned guitar during the buildup. And that's it. Yeah man, everyone knows classic trad goth artists like Porter Robinson, and who could forget the legendary punk band that started it all, Marshmallow. <laughs> Granted, to be fair, one of the songs does actually feature both of these artists, which is something, and the EP does occasionally slip into rock territory a little bit, but like, to call this a goth punk EP is like, like, what, like, what are you talking about? That's like calling Lorna Shore a country band because one of their songs does feature an acoustic guitar during the intro. I understand the thought process, but like, that is, that is an extreme stretch. No disrespect to Rez at all, by the way. She is great. It's just the way publications write about it. That's just... It's just abysmal. And I think it kind of lends itself to the trend of dubstep seemingly struggling to find an identity at times, just latching on to anything that might be potentially relevant instead of just embracing what makes it special to begin with. Like Excision could literally just release a song that has a little part where a dude goes, let's go. And the comment section and like publications would be like, Excision released a new punk song? What? Excision punk era confirmed. Um, Excision just released a punk song and yeah, we're living for it. And that is just so unbelievably cringe. You guys gotta turn that down by like 90%. <laughs> no gatekeeping, by the way. A little bit of genre blending is always cool. It's cool to see little influences kind of make its way into one and the other. It's neat. But the occasional desperate clamoring on a social level to try and be something with more of a defined identity is just... So cringe. You guys gotta knock that off. Like one time, and this is real by the way, this is a real story. One time I was in college and there was this dude who was, no joke, wearing a baseball jersey. Go figure. I overheard this dude and he was having a conversation with his friend and he was genuinely complaining, not as a joke, he was genuinely complaining that metal fans are trying to steal headbanger culture and like... <laughs> I can't even unpack how silly that is. Yo, dude, did you hear that the, the dude from the Dead Mouse song is trying to start a band, apparently? Yeah, they're like totally ripping off Rez. It's messed up. Don't worry, by the way, I'm not trying to butt heads or start any genre beef. I, I just find it interesting to see the, this kind of weird identity crisis happen on occasion. Granted, this only applies to like 1% of like the really annoying ravers. Frankly, most ravers are... <laughs> pretty nice people, frankly. I don't know, I'd just be doing myself a disservice by not bringing it up, but I do find it fascinating. In closing, dubstep aesthetics can be really hit or miss, but when it hits, it's really sick. I would love to see more of the artists involved in the art and the live production get more credit, however. In more extreme subgenres, it's usually very easy to find out who did the art, but when it comes to electronic music, it can be surprisingly very difficult. Outside of the Roboto, Safe Haven, and Scythe, I actually have no idea who's behind 99% of the art that I showcased here today. And that that's kind of unacceptable. Some artists you can only find if you go on their Instagram and scroll all the way back to like 2016 where they weren't tagged, but they left a comment thanking them for being commissioned. And it, it, sh it should not be that difficult. How is the artist completely left out of the credits, but who licensed or distributed it is extremely readily available information? Is that not offensive? I'm not scolding anyone, by the way. It's just, if you're a producer watching, just doing the little gesture of art by at blank, or just tagging them in the announcement posts of the album, just really goes a long way. Not only is it fair and nice, but it also makes my job easier. <laughs> because although it's all in service to the music or whatever, the artists behind the visuals, the people behind the stage production, all the people who just don't get any credit are just as important. Without all of the artists coming together and pulling off all this crazy stuff, EDM would look like this. This is why I made an entire video talking about it. It's because I appreciate it and 
hopefully you do too. Whew. Anyways, uh, if you enjoyed this video, please share it. I know it's awkward sharing things, but sharing stuff really goes like a super long way. I feel like dance music subreddits might really like this video, but I don't know how to use Reddit. So anyways, subscribe if you want, buy some merch if you want, crust bag baseball jersey coming soon. Anyways, that's it. I'm tired. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I love you. Bye. Maybe it's memes. Maybe you just, just, just stick with some more memes.